This podcast is part of the Batman Universe Podcast Network, hosted by the BatmanUniverse.net. Check out everything related to Batman and the entire Bat family at the BatmanUniverse.net, including news and original content related to comics, movies, television, merchandise, video games, and more. Also, check out some of the other unique podcasts that TBU has to offer. Consider supporting this podcast by becoming a patron on Patreon. Even $1 can go a long way in supporting this content that you enjoy. Look for a link over at the BatmanUniverse.net to offer your support now. And now, on with the show. <laughs> The no fun boy had an accident. Let's put a smile on his face. <laughs> Leave him alone. And get off my property. You're trespassing. Oh, is that right? It's okay. I can handle this. Who do you think you're talking to, old man? We're the Jokers! Sure you are. <laughs> <laughs> Hey everybody, this is Bat Fans. Yes, we're still here. This is episode number 182. Um, my name is Dane, and as always, Tim is with me. Tim, how have you been? What's up, Dane? Yes, we're back <laughs> after missing the last episode, unfortunately, but doing good. A lot of stuff's happened since our last episode, but probably none bigger, Dane, than the fact that we got a new 311 album over that course of time <laughs> so you know what i've been blasting and listening to the last several weeks since our last episode <laughs> yes uh so somehow tim um you know just 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 being on twitter following you i i, I had the slightest 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 indication <laughs> a new 311 album it's like you heard the album without even hearing it with all my tweets that I've been talking about it yeah, <laughs> and describing it's, the songs. <laughs> it's it's so weird, Tim. I mean, I I, I just had this feeling that Three Eleven, a band that I do not follow, uh, a, a, a a band that I I've only really heard like one or two of their songs. Aside from um, the album I had you listen to a while back, right, <laughs> which right, right, I, right, I probably don't remember too many of those songs <laughs> if you only heard it once. Yeah, what was that album called? Uh, Voyager, Transistor. I mean, Transistor, right. Voyager is the new one, right? Yes. Mm. Yeah. You know, so, so somehow I just, I, I just had a feeling that there had been a new album. So, Tim, uh, wh- why don't you tell us about uh, 311's new album, Voy- Voyager? Is it any good? Is it, uh, did it let you down? Um, well, 311 has never let me down with a new album release, and that streak continues with Voyager. I oh. love it. Shocker, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you could call me a 311 apologist so, or just someone who likes anything they put out. Maybe that's true, but I don't care. I like what I hear, and I'm going to you know, say why I love it. But uh, it's a great album. To me, it's... They just continue to do what they do best, which is explore new territory and new styles for them, as well as keeping that classic 311 sound that I know and love, which made me fall in love with them back in the 90s. So it's just a great mixture of both, of kind of moving forward with some new styles, but keeping what I know and love for them. So a lot of good, heavy songs in this one, which is right up my alley. A lot of great, cool guitar riffs in this one. Which you know, mixing with that rap rock, which I know is not everyone's cup of tea, but it's what 311 does best, <laughs> and I love right. it. But then they go. My only kind of, not, uh, I guess, complaint about it is that some of the new directions they go, mainly vocally, is they even said it before the album came out, so I was kind of prepared for it. Where they're trying to establish kind of more of that modern sound that you hear. It's some so some especially their lead single, which is called "Good Feeling," it's a little more poppy than anything they ever put out, and that's 
wasn't really one of my favorites <laughs> once they heard the single and I'm getting used to it. I don't ask doesn't necessarily hate it, but it's not one of my favorite of theirs. And then certain other songs where it's like a verse or two, it's a different type of style for them, which isn't really my favorite. But other than that's just like a couple of nitpicks here and there. But there's 13 tracks and I overall love all 13 of them except that one I was talking about good feeling that one's just okay <laughs> but yeah they continue to amaze me with putting out material that I just continue to love and enjoy and as at the same time they keep progressing with their musical styles too so yeah I love it <laughs> which I'm sure is coming to a surprise as no one <laughs> is are, are they all still the uh original members of 311 yeah, that's one of the coolest things wow. about them. They're, I believe they're in the top three or four of longest-running bands that have the original lineup since the beginning. I think oh, yeah. I believe they're behind U2 and Radiohead. And there was another band, but I'm not sure exactly who it was, but U2 and Radiohead are like the only two that I know that are ahead of them as far as having the original members since the beginning. Mm, I see. And, the, and uh, remind me, Tim, are, are, are they like a... They're, they're a ska band. Or like a reggae yeah. band? Or... They have, definitely have some reggae styles in there, but they're such a mixture of a lot of different styles. It's hard just oh. to pin them in one music category. They just have, incorporate so many styles into the music. So because you definitely got reggae, you got rock, like I said, you got the hip hop, you got like, they like to call dance hall styles. So there's a lot of genres mixing together. Oh, I see. And <laughs> you see, I, I, I feel like I ask you this every single time this band comes up. Um, but, but what was that song that um, that was off that green album? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was. You do ask me that every that, time. <laughs> yeah, that, that hit song, I forget. Come original. <laughs> yeah, yeah, come original. That's the one. Like the, the the music video is like 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 they're skateboarding or something. Yeah, there's a skate. They're not skateboarding, but they have a skateboarder who's skating on a half pipe. Got some like dancers there they're playing in front of this big barcode barcode <laughs> on like the on a green screen so oh i see yeah i feel i feel, I feel like i ask you that every single time yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Does it, that, that's the only song i know from them even though i did listen to the the entire album transistor which is not what that song is off of <laughs> yeah i know i i, I know they sing uh amber I hear Amber every, every once in a while. Yeah, that's probably their biggest hit. But uh, the, the the biggest song that I, I hear them sing, or I, I hear on the radio, is their cover of Love Song. Mm -hmm. That uh, was definitely a big hit for them, yes. But yeah. probably not as much as Amber was, I think. Really? Yeah. And that's uh, the song they do at every single show. So I've heard that song at every concert I've been to, except my very first one before that song was released and the album that song came out. So <laughs> everyone since then, it's like a staple and the crowd loves it every time. That's the one that gets the biggest cheer and applause whenever that opening guitar riff starts. Was that like the, the, the um, encore song? No, it's usually kind of in the middle of the set list. It's usually, it's oh. a slower song. So usually they play it after a heavy song or before a real heavy song. Just to oh, kind of I mix see. it up a bit. And and what's their encore song? It's usually down to close it out. And they usually throw kind of a random one here and there. But usually down, their other big, big hit, the one that made them famous, is what closes out a show. Oh. I've never heard that song. I, you've had to. I think if Damn. maybe it's not familiar with it, but if you hear it, you go, oh, okay, I remember that song. Well, you, you got me curious, Tim. <laughs> Now just you gotta hear me, it down. Yeah, I'm just gonna look it up really quick. Um, it's the song that made them famous back in '96. It starts off with a really cool heavy guitar riff. You got the rapping, then you got a catchy chorus that'll get stuck in your head once you hear it. Maybe if I look up 311. <laughs> Did up. you just type in down? <laughs> yeah, because <I just> there, <laughs> there's a lot of songs that are just titled down. <laughs> yeah. uh, down 95. Yeah. Is that a self-titled album? Yep. Technically, it came out in 95, but it didn't become popular until 96. The oh, one they blew up. And is the year I first discovered them and became a fan. It's immediately recognizable. So if you don't recognize it, then maybe you never did hear it before. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm just listening to the 
it's like rapping in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Maybe when you get into the chorus, maybe that'll trigger it. Yeah. Because, like I said, it's a real catchy chorus. No. <laughs> Still. <laughs> not really. It's not ringing any bells. <laughs> who, who, who's, so who's the rapper? Doug Martinez, but he's known as S.A. in the band. They all, there's two members that have nicknames. S.A., the rapper and the singer. But he has a great voice. He's not just for known for rapping. He could sing with the best of them. And then the bass player, Peanut. Peanut, <laughs> yep. uh, and and uh, the the guy that's rapping doesn't do the singing. No, he it just depends on the song. Like I said, he can. Oh. There's songs where he just sings with a you know, with, with a great voice. Like I said, so if you just hear the songs where he's rapping, you might not think he could sing, but he that really has a great voice and good range too. Oh, he can go see. really high. Well, that's so, yeah. really cool. Um, uh, album cover. Are you looking at the for uh, Voyager? Oh yeah, I was gonna say it's the blue one or the new one, Voyager. But <laughs> yeah, Voyager is <laughs> really cool. And uh, one thing I was a little upset how they released and promoted this thing because I pre-ordered it obviously when they announced it. You know, didn't wanted to get it right away. But then, like a week before the album drops, they announce a new set of pre-order bundles where you get the the album and you pre-order with a T-shirt. But one thing, which is kind of cool, which I never would have expected from them, you get a, com- a 311 comic book when you pre-order the album. But really? I was too late because I already got mine <laughs> before yeah. they announced that. So, And right now, they said that's the only way you can get the comic is when you pre-order the album. But hopefully, they'll release more of it because I want to check out what a 311 comic is like. <laughs> well, Tim, you got a double dip. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, you, 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 Yeah, you got to like... It, Definitely crossed my mind. Don't get me wrong, but you know, yeah. I'm not. I'm not made of money. <laughs> <laughs> so well, yeah, anyway, check, everyone check yeah. out Voyager. I highly recommend it. Even if you never heard of him before, or you've heard me talk about it so many times on the podcast, but never decided to check him out, <laughs> give this one a spin. Yeah, I've only ever heard come original and low sound <laughs> Tim. <laughs> well, so now you've heard it. down. <laughs> yeah. Um. But anyway. Uh, let's get to our Dark Knight Rises minute by minute commentary. Um, we're going from minute uh, 130 to minute 131, or um, what is it, Tim? Two hours and 10 minutes? Yes. Two hours is... and 11 minutes. We're almost there, Tim. <laughs> we're getting closer. <laughs> I, I will say there's. Not. It, whether you're saying the two hours and 10 minute mark is the two hours and 11 minute mark, or you're describing it as 130 to 131, there's a lot of 311s in this number. So it's fitting <laughs> with the 311 theme for this episode. <laughs> oh, I, I guess. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Am I stretching just a little bit? <laughs> just a little bit. Um, maybe your 311 enthusiasm is getting to be unhealthy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh oh, should I cut back on my uh, <laughs> 311 addiction? No, no, you, you still haven't been on the cruise, Tim. That is true. Uh, That's one thing I got to ch- check off my 311 fandom is a big part of the 311 experience. I keep hearing from people. So, eventually. yeah, I mean, you have to go on one of those cruises and report back. What I mean, what's going on there? Did you get to meet the band? How was the concert? I assume mm-hmm. they play a show there. Oh, yeah, they play several shows. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, well, hopefully I don't get seasick because I've never been on a cruise or anything like that. So. <laughs> yeah, and hopefully they're, they, um, it's actually a good uh, boat, mm-hmm. you know, cruise ship, um, because some of them can be not as nice, Tim, j- just from personal experience. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've heard good experiences about from other fans I follow on Twitter and interact with, so it seems to be like they... Don't oh, okay. go cheap on it and get a good <laughs> boat and a cruise line. <laughs> they uh, go all out on it. Sounds like it. At least, you know, yeah. maybe not all out, but it's a pleasant experience for all those on there. How much is a ticket for that? You know what? I never really looked, to be honest, because <laughs> yeah. it was never really something I was able to get to. Because, you know, not only do you have to go to the cruise, they got to travel to like Florida to where they, you know, disembark <laughs> on the cruise. So. So traveling involved just to get to the cruise. Yeah, I know. Must be expensive then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but my plan um, is to go to the next 311 day in 2020, which 
might be in Vegas again, which you know isn't too far. So that's my plan. So, so what do they do for three eleven day then? They just put on a super long show. Sometimes it can be one night that's like super long, or they yeah. split it up into two nights where it's you know two like three and a half hour to four hour shows over the course of a weekend, which is. I went in 2012, which was really cool. That was my first and only 311 days so far, and I've been wanting to go back again. So hopefully this time I'll be able to. Those shows are amazing. Do tons of rare songs that you never heard before. Old songs that they never played live, which they debuted for the first time. It's just a great time to hear a bunch of rare songs. Uh, I see. And like, is there anything else like surrounding the concert? Meaning, like, is there like a 311 no, carnival. They, no, not a carnival. They have these <laughs> they have fan parties that happen oh, like the night before the show or yeah. a little bit before a show. So there's kind of events to go on. But it was just crazy because last time I when I went to the twelve was at the MGM Grand Hotel and just walking through the hotel, everyone's wearing a three eleven shirt and you know <laughs> who's there for the event and just people just giving high fives and saying what's up. So just a good atmosphere in the hotel when you're walking around on three eleven day. Yeah. Um, well, anyway, uh, let's do our, our Dark Knight Rises Minimum yes, uh, commentary. Um, let's see what 311 references I can try to you know, <laughs> mix in here. <laughs> well, maybe Batman uses a transistor. <laughs> Ooh, <at> some point. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe he goes on a voyage. <laughs> ah, and like becomes see, a you're doing voyager. good already. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe. Um, um let's see Tim. Maybe the the love between Catwoman <laughs> and Batman becomes a beautiful love song. Uh, <laughs> you're doing great date, I love it. <laughs> or or maybe uh when Batman is fighting Bane, uh the, the camera shifts to a certain position and the the light turns into amber. <laughs> <laughs> That's the color of his energy. It's <laughs> a lyric of the song. <laughs> How am I doing, Tim? Oh, you're doing great. Because I've or... only heard two songs, and I'm impressed. <laughs> or what's the name of that new single, Good Feeling or something? Yeah. Uh... Or may... I, I have a really good feeling, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bravo, Dane. Bravo. Uh, sorry. Uh... Yeah, but yeah, uh, our, let's do our Dark Knight Rises minute by minute commentary. So, of course, grab your VHS tape, grab your uh, Blu ray, grab your DVD, grab your uh, projector, grab your um, beta, grab your HD DVD, grab your laser disc, and uh, grab your Blockbuster physical subscription uh, identification card, and grab your Netflix physical media subscription card. Um, and how could I forget, Tim? I almost forgot, but how could I ever forget our favorite you. way? You know, this is the way that it's meant to be seen. Uh, grab your VHS to DVD converted copy of the Dark Knight Rises Minute by Minute uh, commentary track. Uh, so, Tim, are you ready? I am ready. Let's do it. All right. Three, two, one, play. Catwoman is saying her goodbye to Batman. I don't know. Is this a final goodbye, Tim? Oh, God, I don't know. <laughs> you know, she has to get out of the city before Bane's Time Bomb goes off, which is the first track of 311's 10th album, Universal Pulse. So I got one in there. <laughs> <laughs> I was just about to say, if, she, if they never see each other again, it would be a very bad love. <laughs> <laughs> And I hope the bat pod she's on has a good sound system for her to listen to some music on, which is the name of 311's fifth album. <laughs> I was like already... the shot. I was yeah. like the shot of uh, Catwoman riding the, the bat pod. I just like how this transitions to the scene where all the police are lined up, the snow's falling, there's no music, you know, just building sus- the suspense of the big battle that's about to go down. Yeah. Which we'll see on the next episode. Oh, no. And we ended on the two hour and 11th minute mark. Just an (laughs) hour away from the 311th minute. (laughs)
you know, I've always wondered why um, Foley uh, shows up um, dressed in full, you know, police man uniform. Yeah, it's like all his you know, medals and accommodations. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, don't you want to be comfortable if you're fighting for your life? But yeah, I want to have good maneuverability when this battery going to be having right here. But I guess he was there to, I don't know, inspire the police <laughs> for whatever reason. <laughs> Yeah, I guess. I guess he, so. I, he didn't care about his uniform getting damaged or ruined. I guess. Yeah. Well, he doesn't have to after this. Right. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> <under. laughs> um, but uh, why don't you tell everybody about our featured topic? It's a really big one, Tim. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, in case you didn't know, Com- San Diego Comic Con happened last weekend as we're recording this episode. So. Obviously, we got to do our annual Comic Con recap, or just you know talking about some of our favorite news and announcements that happened throughout the convention. Of course, it's going to be talking about some of the Batman and DC related stuff, but then anything else that caught our fancy that we're excited about that got announced at Comic Con. So we'll go ahead and get in right into that as our feature topic. And you know, I usually save my favorite or biggest news and announcements for last, but. I'm just going to kick this one off right away. <laughs> but of course, was the biggest announcement for me. Batman Beyond, its 20th anniversary panel. And just that by itself. The fact that they're celebrating the 20th anniversary of Batman Beyond, which I can't believe is 20 years old. But you got Bruce Tim there. You got Kevin Conroy there. You got Will uh, Fredo there, who voices Terry. You got Andrea Romano. James Tucker, Glenn Murakami, Stan Berkowitz, just all the creative forces and the main actors behind the show all together in one room talking about this show. And it was a great panel. It's, it is available on YouTube to watch. So I think you just type in Batman Beyond 20th Anniversary Panel. You'll be able to find it and watch it. And man, I just, whether it's Batman the Animated Series, Batman Beyond, Justice League, Superman, I just never get tired of hearing Bruce Timm and the creators talk about the process of the show and just all their series but in this case for batman beyond it was just great having hearing them look back on it hearing how you know the process of uh what made them cast uh, will as terry finding out bruce tim's a big tgif fan <laughs> and being a bad boy meets world is what him and his wife actually his wife actually encouraged him to try out will to be cast as batman and Great insights to the development of certain story ideas. The one that stood out to me is I never heard it before. Maybe I just forgot, but a lot of people were the topic came out and need, or came up during the panel. Even just fans asking questions about the Justice League episode epilogue, which of course uh, wrapped up the Batman Beyond story and Terry revealed the relationship between Terry and Bruce, where Terry is actually his son. And the thing that came news to me was that it was revealed that a return of the Joker was a huge success. And Bruce Timmy just said, disappointingly said, which it wasn't, which was sad to hear. And obviously it's well received critically by fans as a, one of the greatest Batman animated movies ever, but apparently it didn't sell very well, sadly, but he said if that did sell well, and they got a sequel. Um, they had story ideas for what that sequel movie would have been. And a lot of those story elements that were an epilogue originated from their ideas of what they would do in a sequel. And they said that's where the idea of Terry being Bruce's son and all that coming about. But what was different in the movie, they were going to have it be Catwoman, who was orchestrated the whole idea of they're always needing to be a Batman and got the McGinnis family um, to, you know, be the ones chosen to birth uh, Terry as Bruce's son instead of it being Amanda Waller, which it was in the epilogue episode. So just a lot of cool insight there. Hearing Kevin Conroy and, you know, reminisce about being cast as old Bruce Wayne and how um, he diff- tried to make that different from his previous performances. So all that stuff was just great as a diehard fan of the series. It's awesome. So definitely check that out. But before the panel was even held they, and when they announced it, um, they teased a special announcement to be made at the convent or at that panel. So I thought it could be either one of two things. One, we're going to get a new Batman Beyond animated movie or a new series, which would have been awesome and I would have been ecstatic for. But the other one I thought that was more likely and ended up being the case was that we were getting a Batman Beyond complete series Blu-ray set. And that was announced at the panel. And boy, am I excited for that. (laughs) Uh, Right when I heard the news, looking at my phone, I just went like, yes, (laughs) this is happening. And the best part is, is it's coming out this year. 
which if you remember from Batman, the animated series Blu-ray set that got announced at Comic-Con, I believe it was 2017 and it took over a year for it to come out, but it was definitely worth the wait. You've heard my review on this show about how much I love that set and looks like Batman Beyond is getting the same treatment here. It's going to be incredible. The same, same style of box set release where it's going to come with those, uh, this comes with a Batman Beyond Funko Pop. It's going to come with some of those uh, gloss, uh, glossy cards. And this the folding set that the discs are in is pretty similar to the Batman the Animated Series one. So it's going to be similar, but I'm not going to complain because I liked how the Animated Series set was packaged. And it's going to be out on October. And I believe it's going to be October 29th, if I remember it right. So, but October, it's actually coming out October 15th on digital October 29th on Blu-ray, but then if you have the DC Universe app, it'll be some episodes will be available in HD in August. So a few stages of releases here, but the one I'm most looking forward to is the Blu-ray. And they had after the panel, they released kind of a, a comparison video of what the original footage looked like in the remaster. And man, it looks great. Uh, they showed the classic scene of when Terry first meets Bruce when he's being chased by the Jokers and he stumbles upon Wayne Manor and him, Bruce and Terry take out the Jokers gang and the side by shot comparison to just see how much detail they're putting into the remaster. I almost thought, man, the original looked that bad because <laughs> uh, the quality is so distinctive from the remaster to the original and it looks great. I cannot wait to see all my favorite episodes looking like they never have before. Now, the one caveat with this release and this news is that they made a point to say that unfortunately there were 11 episodes that were, I guess, too damaged. The original files for them were too damaged to get the full um, upscale or remastered treatment. So these 11 are going to be upscaled. I mean, they're still going to look better than what they previously were, but um, they're not going to be on the same level as the other remastered ones. So that's a little disappointing. And actually, as I'm, I didn't read this before. I was curious what episodes are going to be the ones that aren't remastered, or are, are yeah aren't fully remastered. And I kept thinking to myself, hopefully one of it's not the truly best episodes. And one I'm hoping on there is the Centuries of the Last Cosmos, which is the worst <laughs> Batman Beyond episode and one of the worst DC uh, DC uni- animated universe episodes ever. They tried to do a parody on Star Wars and George Lucas, and it uh, was just awful. <laughs> but Looking at the BatmanUniverse.net article about the release, I didn't see this until now, but they have all the episodes that are going to be the ones that are just upscaled and not remastered. And those ones are, so I'm just going to find this out now as I'm reading it. So hopefully it's not too many great ones, but Eyewitness, that's a good one. Final Cut, that's another good one. (laughs) The Last Resort, that one's okay. Armory, it was okay, not great. Sneak Peek, which is a really good one, unfortunately. The Egg Baby, which is a real fun episode. Uh, James Tucker was the one on the panel. Oh, that one kind of got a bad reputation, but I've always enjoyed it. It's a different episode, but it's a lot of fun. Zeta, which is okay, not one of my favorites. Plague. April Moon, which is a different episode, but I really like it. Kind of a dark episode, um, but I always enjoyed it. And thankfully, yes, yeah, Centuries of the Last Cosmos is on there. So <laughs> that episode didn't get the full remastered treatment, and I'm totally fine with that. <laughs> And Speak No Evil, which is another one that wasn't that great, where she has to deal with a gorilla. <laughs> so, yeah, there's a few good ones in here, but also some ones that I'm not too crazy about. So not the end of the world that all of them aren't fully remastered. But, yeah, I cannot wait for this. It's just really cool to finally get another DC Animated Universe series, get the Blu-ray treatment. Uh, so I'm seeing some fans saying, you know, what about Superman? Because that was the one right after Batman the Animated Series. And I can understand that. But with this being Batman Beyond's 20th anniversary, you can't pass up on this opportunity to <laughs> tie that in with the release of the Blu-ray set. And I'm just more than ready to revisit the Batman Beyond world. I mean, I've seen the series several times, obviously, within the last 20 years since it first aired. But um, it's been a few years since I did a full series rewatch, and I'm ready to dive back into it. Just watching the panel, hearing about the Blu-ray, seeing that. Uh, those comparison clips. I mean, it just got me excited about the series and ha- made me remember how much I loved it. So I cannot wait to watch it again and see it in the best quality that it's ever been. So yeah, I'm counting down the days to October 29th. I cannot wait. Now, Dane, if I remember right, on one of our episodes, maybe it was for the 15 year anniversary of Batman Beyond, kind of did a retrospective look at it. Um, you have you said you've never seen it. Has 
that changes at all? Have you seen any episodes? Nope, not really. <laughs> um, I don't think it's available on any streaming service. Yeah, it's only on the DC Universe app. Yeah, and it looks like that's not going to be a thing in a while. Yeah, they'll probably just transfer over to that HBO Max <laughs> app, I would think. Oh, that's probably uh, going to be the way it goes. But I was going to say, this is a perfect opportunity to start watching the series. And now that's going to be in HD. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I got to get on that. Um, because I, I remember watching it when I was a kid, but I don't remember anything from the show. Mm. You know, so. See, that'd be something to be cool for the episode or cool for our show just once it comes out you watch an episode or two and you give your reactions on the show to see if it clicks with you as much as it did for me <laughs> and see if you become a fan of it yeah because i remember terry i remember old bruce wayne i remember dana of mm-hmm. course how could i forget dana because you know her name is almost my name <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah uh have you seen return of the joker though I don't think I have. Yeah, that's a must-watch, regardless if you've seen the show or not. <laughs> I mean, you might be lost in certain areas here and there, but uh, it's so good. That's Is another it... thing. Return of the Joker will be included okay. in this box set as well. Oh, okay. Isn't, um... Isn't Ace in the show, too? Mm-hmm. Yeah. He, Ace and... has a great episode that's focused on him as well, which shows how Bruce uh, became his owner, called Ace in the Hole. That's a great episode. And if I remember correctly, there is something going on with uh, Dick Grayson, right? Mm -hmm. They hinted at, you know, the fallout between Dick and Bruce is always hinted out, but it was never explained until that Kyle Higgins comic, which was essentially a sequel to the series, which was fantastic. Now, it caused a lot of debate as far as (laughs) what Bruce did, what Dick's relationship to that made it sour. But yeah, it's not great that aspect of it but at the same time i think i said this in my review that you know what happened between bruce and dick was so bad that it caused this humongous rift between them that dick wanted nothing to do with it and what happened in that story definitely fit the bill with something that would cause a huge rift between the two so so yeah hopefully you can watch batman beyond once it's available in hd i think i might not i might know someone who could give you access to the dc universe app dane if you don't have it just saying (laughs) oh uh somebody that's finally happy that they that it was brought to uh consoles (laughs) yeah i don't think that's ever been mentioned on this show before so i might have a vague idea of who you're talking about (laughs) (laughs) yeah um have you have you seen the uh soft thing not yet no show um i've heard it's great though yeah, I was just wondering about that because it looked really good and it's unfortunate that it quickly got canceled like, like before but, the show premiered. It was actually, the, I think, the day it premiered. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like the day or a week it premiered they announced it's getting canceled, which sucks. Why? Yeah, I guess, uh, I, I think, the cost? That's what I think. Yeah. But I, I, there's a lot of complicated stuff going on, I think, with the production of it. I don't remember the exact details, but I'm sure that was one of them. And the episode yeah. count even dropped from like 13 to 10 for its first season. So uh, it's just disappointing. But hopefully, I mean, a lot, hopefully a lot of people are watching it. It's getting good reviews, doing well critically. So maybe eventually it'll come back <laughs> in some yeah. way. Yeah, hopefully. So yeah, that was the first big DC or Batman related announcement that I was so excited about for Comic-Con. And another one or another thing I always look forward to at Comic-Con is finding out what next year's DC animated movies lineup is going to be. Um, they always have a premiere for the next DC animated movie coming out close to Comic-Con, and this time it was for Hush. And I've heard reviews on the Hush animated movie have been kind of mixed. I've seen a lot of people say it's great. A lot of people were disappointed with it because there's a big change from the comic. I'm not exactly sure what that is because I'm staying away from spoilers until I see it. But part of me thinks it has probably has something to do with the Riddler at the end of the original comic. I don't know if that's been taken out, altered in some way, but... I'm curious to see what they do in the movie, which should be out on Blu-ray in a couple of weeks. And you'll obviously hear my review once I see it. But um, they announced the three movies that are coming out in 2020. And this list actually surprised me because we're getting not one, but two standalone Superman movies next year in 2020. And the first one is going to be one that a lot of people have been asking for. It's 
regarded as a real classic Superman story, and that is Superman Red Sun, which is finally being adapted into an animated movie, the graphic novel by Mark Miller. So um, this got a lot of people excited, but at the same time, too, a lot of people are kind of concerned about it because I think they want it to be just an adaption of the story in the animation style of the artwork, not set in the DC movie continuity like Hush has been, Death of Superman. So um, we'll see what the case is with Superman Red Sun. And I can understand that. I'm kind of hoping it's the same as well. And I'm going to reveal something that, you know, probably going to have to turn in my DC fan card, but I've never read Superman Red Sun. I know it's something I probably should change. I've heard nothing but great things about it. Even uh, the season of Supergirl, the TV show did a loose base adaption of it, just, you know, replacing the Superman aspect with Supergirl. So I know it's a real regarded story. I should probably read it before I see the movie. But I know a lot of people are very excited about this one finally being adapted. And then also the, we're getting a sequel to the Justice League Dark movie. So maybe this is the 2020 animated film that's set in the movie universe continuity where Red Sun won't be because uh, Justice League Dark obviously was in that continuity. And now we're getting a sequel called Justice League Dark Apocalypse War. Not too much details were revealed about it, but when it's titled Apocalypse War, you kind of get a good sense of what it's going to be about dealing with probably with dark side and the new gods and all that so that should be an interesting one to look out for and then the second superman movie we're getting is superman the man of tomorrow which is being described as just an original uh new story developed for this movie and it's supposed to be about the early days of superman and his career as being you know a hero so it'll be interesting to see how that's going to be if they're going to draw inspiration from any of those kind of or origin stories that Superman has had over the years, but I'm anxious to see what that one's going to be about. And I'm just really surprised there's no Batman movie in 2020. <laughs> I think this is a first since um, the DC animated movie line started in 2007. There's always a Batman movie in the year slate, but not the case with this one. And I, I'm actually okay with that because Batman has had his time in the sun to shine <laughs> without question over these last 12 years with getting several movies a year. I know some people have even complained that Batman's been used too much and they want to give the spotlight to other DC superheroes. And I totally get that complaint, even as a diehard Batman fan. So I'm okay with them skipping a year without a Batman movie. So, But I will say, I'm always hoping at these panels when they announce the next year's slate, one of these years I'm going to hear the name Nightfall mentioned <laughs> as an animated movie. But I'm still waiting for that because it ain't happening next year, obviously. But one of these days, I'll hopefully get that announcement. But after that, um, we got a few new trailers that uh, premiered at Comic-Con that are Batman and DC related. And the first one I wanted to mention was kind of the first full trailer for the Harley Quinn animated series. We kind of got that teaser one, which is just Harley talking to Poison Ivy in an Arkham cell. And this one showing off everything, the animation style, the characters we're going to see, the humor, and really showing that it's going to be a mature <laughs> animated series. A lot of violence, the language, it's not going to be a show for kids and they're really kind of going with that deadpool type comedy and comic book humor <laughs> that he established in the movie and well, i've said before how they kind of looks like in certain aspects not every story with harley but there's certain elements where they want to push harley to be that type of character which i'm not the hugest fan of but at the same time she's a character who can make it work but i will say after watching this trailer the animation looks pretty cool but had I, I don't think this one's gonna be for me it's just i know I keep saying how these characters in the batman universe in general can be adapted in so many ways and that's fine so and it's just gonna be targeting different audiences it's not gonna click for everybody and just seeing this trailer looks like the type of humor they're going for isn't necessarily up my alley but i'm gonna give it a shot maybe it will work and this type of humor and tone will you know fit this version of harley that they're trying to establish in this animated series. So we'll see. It's just some of that, you know, gore, gross out. This, with these trailers, it's hard to do because it seems like they try to really throw that at you to show, hey, look at us. This isn't your typical animated series. It's going to be dark. It's going to be violent. It's going to be filled with adult language and content. And sometimes they try to push that too hard. That takes away from other aspects of the show that might make it really enjoyable. But we'll see. I'm definitely going to give it a shot. But this trailer definitely showed where it's not something that being geared towards my type of uh, DC entertainment, so to speak, that I like to enjoy for the most part. But I don't know if you watched the trailer, Dane, but if you've had, I kind of have a feeling you're probably going to be similar. 
Um, I'm actually looking forward to our next trailer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that says it all um, right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah. You know what? Go ahead and get into it, Dane, because I'm going to completely agree with you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. This Watchmen show, I when it was first announced, I was a little hesitant. I'm of the opinion that, you know, you should not touch anything Alan Moore if he's not going to be involved, which he's not. Right. Yeah. Any adaption uh, of his stuff he's not involved with. <laughs> I mean, we've seen From Hell. We've seen League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. We've seen the Watchmen movie. Um, Which I yeah. think is great, but I know not everyone shares that Yeah, opinion, not everybody but... <laughs> thinks that. But, um, so so it, when the show was announced, I was really hesitant. Um, you know, what is this? What's going on? Um, but... The, the only thing that I was holding on uh, or that, that I was remaining positive about was the fact that uh, Damon Lindelof is the, the showrunner for this show. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if you, you, you probably haven't seen uh, The Leftovers, his show on HBO. No, I haven't, but I've heard it great is, things about it. Yeah, really, really good. It's only three seasons. Um, it starts off in New York, then it goes to... Um, then the next season it's in, um, Texas and then the third and final season it's in, uh, Australia. Uh, it's, it's, it's really good. It's, it's what, what, what would, what would have happened if, um, half of the population just disappeared or 1% of the population, uh, disappeared. Mm. Um, it's, it's really, really, really good. Um. So, so that was the only thing that was I was holding out hope that you know David Lindelof was involved and maybe it would be okay. Uh, it, this trailer specifically surpassed anything that <laughs> I could have imagined. Um, Can I be honest with you, Dave? Yeah, go ahead. When I was watching the trailer. I yeah. kept. I thought to myself, I think this is going to be right up Dane's alley for what he's looking oh, for, yeah. <laughs> the type of TV show. Oh yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it seems to be a more realistic take. Um, seems like these heroes are just regular people, which is what the the Watchmen comic book was all about. Um, now I had heard rumors um, because it, it it wasn't really shown in that first teaser trailer that we got. Uh, that teaser trailer is mostly all Don Johnson, uh, but uh, that um, Doctor Manhattan was going to be in the show, and I was just wondering how that was going to look, how that was going to be, um, and I think that they've got it, Tim. Mm. <laughs> uh, it was only teased at the at the very very end. I mean, you you, you see that he's on Mars. But um, yeah, like a real zoomed out shot. Yeah, <laughs> where you can't pick him out. Yeah, but uh, yeah, at the end when he's picking up the mask and he sees the blue hat, that mm. that got me too. Yeah. <laughs> the first time I see, I, I saw the the trailer, that got me. Um, and you know, see, seeing Regina King as I don't know somebody. Yeah, as uh, a new vigilante. Mm. A new vigilante. She she's like a cop, I think. Yeah. Um, of course, Don Johnson. Uh, how can you go wrong with Don Johnson <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Jeremy Irons? As yeah. uh, it, it, is he playing? Um, uh, what's his name? Uh, yeah, Ozzy Mandias or AJ yeah. White. Yeah, yeah, Ozzy Mandias. Yeah, like an older version. Mm-hmm. And uh, President Robert Ford. As, yeah, uh, starring, <laughs> <laughs> uh, starring Robert Ford. I mean, uh, Robert Redford. Sorry. Um, yeah, I'm so ex- excited for the show, Tim. I can't wait to see it. It looks like it's going to be a realistic take on what would happen after mm-hmm. uh, Watchmen. So, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm excited for the show, Tim. <laughs> Same here. I completely agree with everything you said. And I will say this is probably um, my favorite trailer that we got out of Comic-Con. I mean, it really blew me away. I was excited for the show in general because it's you know new watchman stories and there was always kind of not a clear understanding of what it actually is is it a full-blown sequel is it a reimagining an elseworlds type thing and it's to me it's just looking like a full-blown sequel here and that i believe it's set in modern times like it will be in 2019 just showing what 
that world is like all those years later. Man, it just looks so good. <laughs> just the different aspects they're taking from the Watchmen story and bringing it into you know this modern day setting. I mean, the how it was described as far as those Rorschach fanatics. I mean, Rorschach was a good guy. Yeah, he was wasn't all there and had his you know problems and the way he went about things. But you know, he was a good guy at heart. But these people are taking what he stand stood for in a totally wrong way and going about and just causing chaos and that aspect of causing the police to wear masks so they won't find out who they are. And like I said, having Regina King in the series, she's going to be great. I, I love the show. She was on Southland where she played a detective. She was fantastic in that. And now she's going to be playing a police officer in this, but then becomes a vigilante who looks to be awesome. I just can't wait. The new characters look cool, but then you throw in the old, familiar characters and Silk Spectre is going to be in it and she pops up in the trailer and you know, like I said with Jeremy Irons as Adrian Byte and then Manhattan Tees at the end man there's just so much to love about this series it looks great the visual style to me it, it actually reminds me a bit of Zack Snyder's Watchmen movie it seems like they're keeping that tone very similar so which is fine really, with me too. I didn't that? get that at all. Really? I, yeah, I, yeah I didn't get that at all. I I was thinking more, um, well, m- maybe it's because you haven't seen it, but I was thinking more Watchmen. Uh, I mean, um, sorry, Leftovers. Yeah, that's probably why uh, because, <laughs> I haven't seen it. Uh, especially, yeah. especially in the beginning. I love the beginning of the trailer where it's that stick up, but then uh, Hooded Justice comes in to stop the criminal. His costume looked great, and to me it looked like you know the one was used in Zack Snyder's film. So there's a lot of the way the costumes look and certain characters that to me just had that feel of it. But uh, regardless of how you feel <laughs> and the style, how it looks, it looks great. And that's the most important thing. So yeah, I cannot wait for this series. I'm glad it's another thing that's coming out this year. It's a good thing to look forward to in October. So <laughs> yeah, I cannot wait for the Watchmen TV show. It's, I think it looks fantastic and it could be something special. And I thought uh, Robert Redford retired. Yeah, he said that not too long ago, didn't he? Yeah, it was supposed to be like that that movie that he had, like old man with a gun or something. Yeah. And then <laughs> he was he 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 was uh, he was in Endgame, was he? Yeah, just in a brief cameo role. Yeah, when, yeah. When I went back in that time. was supposed to be his last role. <laughs> <laughs> now I guess it's this <laughs> as president. Hey, what a, I know what a way to go out playing yourself as a president. So. <laughs> I yeah, think that's, that's a good way cool. to cap off a very great career. Yeah, it, it it takes place in like Oklahoma or something. Something I forget if that's the exact place, yeah. but it looks like it. Yeah, I don't know. I just thought I saw like Tulsa, Oklahoma, somewhere. Uh huh. Um, but yeah, I can't wait for this show. <laughs> Me neither. Yeah. So uh, we'll... October is it? Yeah. Yeah. So you'll definitely be hearing us talk about it <laughs> in the lead up of the what's it premieres to hear what we think because yeah i cannot wait for it see i i just wish we could get a batman show like this yeah that would be nice yeah. <laughs> on hbo or something but well i will say moving on because that was some of our main bullet points that we had on our show notes but as i said they're not limited to just those so there's some other things that stood out to me in comic-con maybe not quite as big let me but... guess him let me guess is it uh Jane Silent Bob Strikes Again, or whatever that's called. I actually haven't seen the trailer for that. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> only, seen, yeah, only seen the first scene of it. What about the Top Gun 2 trailer? What the Top Gun Maverick? It looks cool. I mean, yeah. I'm not really a Top Gun guy, but yeah. it that's, looks really cool. That's a good way to describe it. It looks cool. Yeah. To me, yeah. it doesn't blow me away. It looks like anything special. I like the first Top Gun. I mean, I haven't seen it in a while, but... It, yeah. I've always liked it, but the fact that it's getting a sequel is kind of cool. So I'll probably check it out once it comes out. But yeah, I just think it's kind of sad that Maverick did nothing <laughs> in between the time of yeah. Vietnam <laughs> besides being top guy. <laughs> yeah, it's doing not moving up in the ranks. Yeah. Same jacket, I think, like almost the same jet model too. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's kind of sad. So, <laughs> but... hey, someone just doesn't want to move on. <laughs> I guess. Uh, I guess you you don't want to move on for thirty five years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Another You're cool thing. 60. Uh, we didn't actually get a trailer. It was like a behind the scenes video of the new Terminator movie, and you know it's always these. Every time there's a new Terminator movie, it's always oh, only 
this one's going to ignore the, all the other movies. It's going to follow the first two. Like you get that with everyone and they're doing that with this one. But um, this one really looks like it's going to be the case because you got Linda Hamilton back. But the big surprise was that the original actor who played John Connor in the second one is going to be back for this movie as well, which I think might be his second or maybe first movie <laughs> since the original yeah. Terminator. Edward so, Furlong. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think the fact that they're actually getting two of the main cast members back into the franchise again is a pretty cool thing that should really make this feel like a direct sequel of T2, despite the TV show and other movies that came out after it. But um, it looks cool from what I've seen. So that, that'll be another thing that I'll probably look forward to once it comes out. But, I'm all right on that. Uh, which um, is understandable because they milked the franchise yeah. is <laughs> not in a good way. Yeah, like that, so. um, that last one with Daenerys. Yeah, that one yeah. wasn't great. Yeah. Is is Arnold in this one? I mean, I assume he is. <laughs> yeah. is it, it, did you see the... <laughs> no, I'm not making this up, Tim. <laughs> did you see... The, the, this wasn't from Comic-Con. It was just a picture I saw recently. Okay. That, Schwarzenegger and Jackie Chan are making a fantasy movie. Really? <laughs> I yeah. have not seen anything about that. Yeah, I, d- I don't know what it's called. I don't know anything about it, but I just saw a picture of them on set. A recent picture, too. Not yeah. Like something. Hmm. yeah. Let you, me see you, if I can look it up real quick and see anything. Yeah, just type in Arnold Schwarzenegger and yeah. Jackie Chan. I'm sure it'll come up. There it is. Jackie Chan and Arnold Schwarzenegger film gets a, a fantasy film gets a release date in China first, I think. Yeah, what is that? Yeah, I'm trying to see what it's called. <laughs> I don't see a, <laughs> a title for it. Oh, it's called The Mystery of the Dragon Seal, Journey to China. Oh, okay. It's going to be a Chinese thing. Okay. Uh, a yeah, Chinese fantasy movie. I haven't heard anything about it until you said anything or seen anything. Well, that should be an interesting pair up. <laughs> Jack yeah, and Jack this, Schwarzenegger. This is going to be a straight to Netflix. Maybe <laughs> over here in the US it might be. Yeah. But I don't know what those two. I think that's something you, you have to check out immediately. So. <laughs> yeah. um, one thing that I did want to bring up from Comic-Con that everybody seems to be excited about, but I'm a little hesitant on is uh the witcher tv show mm, yeah mm. i am not so sure about that that didn't look very good i i, I know the creators were saying like just wait for the uh the show to come out mm. but i don't know that just doesn't look very good especially like uh the star of the show uh henry cavill uh doesn't look very good mm. you see I'm coming from someone who hasn't played the games or read the books, actually didn't realize the games were based on books till like about a year or two ago. So I, I saw the trailer and to me, I think it looks good, but nothing about it really got me excited to really want to check it out. Like nothing stood out to me as like, Ooh, this is going to be something different and unique for the fantasy genre. So I know a lot of people who are fans of the books and games seem to like it and think they're doing a good job, but since I'm not familiar with pretty much anything of the source material it's based on, nothing really stood out and jumped out at me. So um, I might check it out if it gets really good positive word of mouth. I know my brother really loved the game, so he's going to watch it. Maybe I'll watch it with him at some point. So I don't know. I didn't necessarily think it didn't look good. I'm just not super excited about it right now. Yeah. Have yeah, you I mean, played the yeah. games, right? I thought I remember you saying that. Well, I only played the the third one. Okay. Which I heard is really good, though. But. It is really good. It's it's one of the best games I've played. Um, but, yeah, the show I'm not so sure about. Um, I, I, I guess you just listen to the creator. Yeah. <laughs> I just I just trust the judgment, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Was there a Final Fantasy VII trailer? No, right? No, there's nothing for Final Fantasy VII. <laughs> yeah, because... Uh, I thought there was, and that let me down like a YouTube um, rabbit hole, okay. <laughs> I guess you can say. Yeah, if there was, I definitely would have known about it, because <laughs> yeah. I would have missed the new Final Fantasy trailer. <laughs> Which, not too surprising, since E3 was not too long ago, and they had a, showed off a bunch of stuff from that game, so I can't really yeah. play it. 
Ha- have you have you ever read um the oral history of Final Fantasy Seven? No, but that sounds like something I'd probably love. <laughs> Would want to yeah, get into. it's it's uh it's on Polygon. If you if you just type in like oral history of Final Fantasy Seven, it's it's really it's really enlightening, especially like um you know the stuff between Square at the time and and Nintendo uh, and Nintendo. Yeah. <laughs> it's like That's... they. Where things fell apart, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's like some people said said that so, so some people at Square said Nintendo didn't talk to them for ten years after that. Yeah, that's about right. Yeah. <laughs> they, Nintendo wanted nothing to do with them because they felt betrayed. <laughs> yeah, and it was funny because um, I can't remember who it was. Might have been Kitase, I think, who was saying like they. They were playing like uh, 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 Mario, the like 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 the Mario game, and they were playing uh, Ocarina of Time, and they were wondering how Nintendo did that because they were having a super hard time mm. <laughs> uh, with, with the N sixty four. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I mean they had a tech demo of what a Final Fantasy game would have been on the sixty four. It was the Final yeah. Fantasy VI characters just rendered right, in the right. four engine. Yeah. They don't look that great. <laughs> yeah. And it was funny because like in the beginning of the the, um, the oral history, they were like, okay, we're going to do a full, I mean, um, a, a full 3D but 2D background thing. Mm. And this is going to be the first 3D Final Fantasy. Uh, this is what we're going to be doing for Final Fantasy VII. How do we do that? Like th- there was nobody at Square that knew how to do that. Yeah, <laughs> they had, they had to hire people for that. Hey, well, probably a rocky road to get there, but they yeah. created a masterpiece with Final Fantasy VII, which I actually just got on the Xbox One. They were having a sale, and I've been wanting to get all the Final Fantasy games again remastered and have it all on one system. So, yeah, I started with Final Fantasy VII, and man, they did it. The little upscale they did for it i was actually impressed i mean i know it's based off the one they did for the pc but i never played that and just only experiencing the original playstation one the graphical enhancements look pretty good (laughs) as far as being upscaled a bit so that was cool and i actually just got speaking of final fantasy i never there's a book series put out by dark horse called the ultimania archive and just it's broken up into three volumes the first one goes to final fantasy one through six and then the second one goes to final fantasy seven through nine and then the third one 10 to 14 which i don't know why they didn't wait to put 15 on there but regardless i got the first volume it's a really cool encyclopedia look at the developments of the first six games you got great artwork yeah. um, development stories inside the characters and this development of the game is a lot of cool stuff so i actually have to get the other two volumes but i didn't know they put that out but now that once i saw it i immediately had to get it and had to start with the first one because some of those character designs and artwork concept art for those first few games are so good and some of my favorites so any final fantasy fans check that out but they're on sale at amazon for like 18 bucks which is a really good deal because it's a pretty big book yeah um i i guess what surprised me was or what i had totally forgotten because like like you i haven't played seven since i played it the first time right mm-hmm. um was that it's it's not a fantasy it's sci-fi yeah <laughs> it's, it's all sci-fi pretty much i totally forgot about that and it wasn't until nine that they went back to the whole i mean full-on fantasy mm. totally forgot about that <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but but it's great to hear that the um the the final fantasy 7 remake i mean not remake the i don't know what you call it conversion yeah i guess <laughs> easy version onto the onto the playstation 4 is really good because I bought it. I just haven't played it because I, I I can't remember which release it was, but I heard it wasn't very good. Yeah, they've they've had they must have had several updates since then, probably because it's been out for a few years on the PS4. Yeah, yeah. And I know the ports that they put on the Switch and the Xbox just a few months ago were a lot better. So I would imagine the PS4 yeah. one probably had some updates for it. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I haven't fully like dived into the whole game again, but I've been playing it here and there, just kind of reminiscing as I go through it, just remembering what a great game it was. So it's nice just to kind of casually just start it up and play 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 with it for a few minutes or an hour or so. That's really good. <laughs> how how far did you get? 
uh, only to where he met Eris oh. at the church. So making their escape, that's as far as I got so far. But oh, that's you know, really early. <laughs> yeah, like I said, I haven't been devoting too much time for it, just popping yeah. it in here and there. But yeah, no Final Fantasy news at Comic Con, but still got to talk about Final Fantasy VII, <laughs> which is <laughs> awesome. But going back to more of the DC side of things, a couple of other things that stood out. And this one wasn't necessarily announced at Comic Con, but it kind of got fully unveiled and more details are made about it. Was something that I'm excited for, which is that we're going to see Brandon Ralph play Superman again, which I never thought would happen in a million years. But on the Crisis on Infinite Earths crossover coming this year on all the CW TV shows, Brandon Ralph will be playing Superman again. And I cannot wait for that. Along with, uh, Tyler Hoshin's Superman, which we saw in Supergirl and last year's crossover, who I really enjoyed as Superman. So we're going to be seeing them both hopefully interact together, but seeing two different Superman is going to be awesome. And at first, when it was first announced, I just thought, oh, it's going to be, you know, the Superman Returns version of the character played by Brandon Routh, and he's going to be back, same costume and everything, which I would have been totally okay with, minus a few tweaks of the costume I was hoping for, because I'm not a big fan of the Superman Returns suit. Yeah, I was but, about to say, are you happy with that one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like the, the maroon on it? <laughs> yeah, not my favorite. And the fact that that's what they use for Smallville's finale in the very few shots we got of the suit <laughs> was the same one. Why did they use that? Was it just available? I, I That had to be. It was probably yeah. cheap. It was right there. <laughs> <laughs> but at Comic-Con, that's where it was revealed of the Superman he will be playing, and it is going to be the Kingdom Come version of the older Superman. And that... Got me even more excited to see, you know, Brandon Ralph portray that version of Superman. And I just cannot wait to see him as Superman. I cannot wait for this crossover. It's going to be gigantic, and it's going to it's going to be Arrow's last season. And I think it's going to cultivate into that crossover. I'm not sure if the final episode is going to be the Arrow version or the Arrow part of that crossover, or there'll be one more after it. But you know, it's all going to lead to that because season seven of Arrow ended with Oliver going with the monitor um, to prepare for the crisis. So that's pretty much what season eight is going to be about. And it's only 10 episodes long. And the crossover usually happens in December. And that's usually the ninth episode of each uh, series when they get to that point. So it's going to be near the end of Arrow's run. And I just can't wait to see how it's going to be <laughs> and wrap up not only for Arrow, but just all the characters that are going to be involved. It's going to be massive. I think every show is going to be involved with it. Legends of Tomorrow, Batwoman is going to be part of the crossover as far as the actual series. So one of its episodes will be part of the crossover. Just, oh, It's going to be huge, and I hope they can pull it off and that they're not biting off more they can chew with a TV budget and all that. But it sounds ambitious, and I just like all the crazy stuff we're going to get, and especially with Brandon Rolfe playing Superman again. I think it should be really, really cool. And also, speaking of DC TV. This is another thing I'm getting more and more excited about because I've actually finally started watching Titans on the DC Universe app, Dane. I heard me obviously hope, say I was going to hold off until I got it on the console so I can watch it on TV. Yeah. And I'm glad to say it's been worth the wait. I've been really, really enjoying it. I mean, it didn't get off to the best start with that first trailer at last year's Comic-Con with the F Batman line and really throwing at you the dark and grittiness of it and the mature content. But that stuff's in there, but that's not, you know, what the thrust of the show is about. I got to say, these they're nailing the characters, especially Dick in the show. He's been fantastic. Brendan Twites is doing a really good performance. I just love the avenue and the, the way they're exploring Dick as a character, him moving on for Batman. It is a darker version of Robin, but with the story they're telling, I think it works really well. There's been some great episodes. The Doom Patrol episode that introduces them made me more excited for their series. How they're uh, establishing Raven. She's been a great character in her relationship with Dick. And Dick kind of being that mentor figure for not only her, but kind of the other Titans. But the episode I just watched last night was when uh, Jason Todd got in the picture. And that episode blew me away. I loved it. It's I mean, we haven't had the best versions of Robin in live action <laughs> when he's not very many opportunities as well. I mean, it's only Burt Ward and Chris O'Donnell, but we finally got a great Robin story told in live action with that Jason Todd episode. The way it explored the dynamic between Jason and Dick, not only was it fun to see them interact with each other, but just how different they are. 
and how they view the mantle of Robin was just so, so well done. And then they explore, have some flashbacks of Dick as Robin going into, you know, wanting to try to get Tony Zuko for murdering his parents. And there's a little Robin, Robin's Reckoning vibes in from Batman the Animated Series. Once he confronts Zuko, it turns out in a different way. But, man, I just loved how they explored Dick's history and, and the stuff, the mantle of Robin. It's just so, so good. So I'm not finished with the series yet. I'm on episode eight, so I'll probably finish it this weekend, but I'm officially a fan of this series. Uh, it's been worth the wait, and I am really excited for season two to begin now, So, <laughs> which at Comic-Con, they announced it's going to be premiering on September 6th, so don't have very long of a wait. And I believe they showed a trailer there, but they didn't release it to the public. And, and also, too, there's a tragedy that happened on production of it where someone actually got killed during a filming what? of a sequence, yeah. Wow. So I think that might have been the reason why they weren't talking about it too much or releasing a trailer or whatnot. The timing wasn't right, probably out of respect for that worker and his family. But you know, obviously it sucked that that happened and they had to deal with that. Right. But um, the series will be premiering on September, like I said, and they did show a trailer. And some images did leak out. They had one that showed some of the Titans, like Robin and Aqualad, who's going to be a new character for the season um hawk and hawk and dove i believe were in that shot but also they had a you know what's the best quality but our first look at deathstroke is going to be a major part of the season and his costume even in that it's not necessarily a blurry image but not the best quality his suit is looking pretty cool it is a little different to, to me there's a little dead shot mixed in <laughs> look i can see a red lighting in his eyes that reminded me of dead shot but again not the best quality image to judge it on but just the fact that Deathstroke is going to be in it is awesome and then we know Bruce and Batman is going to be in it that's another thing watching this first season you know Batman's not in it as we know but his presence is still felt you hear him mentioned you hear him name you hear Bruce mentioned especially in the flashbacks with Dick taking him in and that's just making me more excited knowing that we're actually going to see Bruce in the next season and I just can't wait to see that dynamic between him and this version of Robin, because I'm loving what I'm seeing of this season. So yeah, I'm officially a fan of Titans, and I'm li really looking forward to season two now. Now that I'm fully invested in the show, it was definitely worth the wait. I'm glad I waited <laughs> to watch it on my TV on 4K and the best quality possible because it's is it's a series that I think deserves to be watched that way. Is it uh, is it going to get canceled? Um before season two uh, you know what I, I wish i could definitively say no but <laughs> after what happened with swamp thing who knows so at least it's getting to season two i should be thankful yeah. for that <laughs> and it looks like they're going all out like i said you got batman you got deathstroke superboy is going to be in it so i'm excited for it i'm hoping they just go really into that dc universe lore which they have in the first season which makes it so enjoyable so yeah i cannot wait yeah and I guess for me, I don't know if you have any other stuff that stood out for you at Comic-Con, Dane, but the last thing I'll mention is how can I not mention probably the biggest panel of Comic-Con, the MCU panel, <laughs> revealing all their plans for Phase 4. Now that Infinity, or now that Endgame has, has come out, the Infinity Saga is over, and now they have to announce their new slate of films. And this new phase of Marvel is going to be interesting because it's not just movies. We're getting Disney Plus TV shows as well. Which, you know, wasn't a huge surprise because Hollywood Reporter and other trades were reporting the announcement of these shows coming out. But now that we know they're official, uh, there's a lot of stuff to be excited for. I mean, Captain America, or I should say Falcon and the Winter Soldier, which I'm sure will end up being Falcon becoming Captain America by the time the series is over. That's the one I'm probably most excited about of the Disney Plus series. I just love that they're going to explore that relationship between Falcon and Bucky Moore. You got Baron Zemo coming back where he's going to have his comic accurate mask, which looks going to look cool, which he didn't have in Civil War. So I can't wait for that show. But then you also got um, Wanda, WandaVision, which is going to be about uh, Scarlet Witch and um, Vision, obviously. But they said they're really going to delve deep into Wanda being the Scarlet Witch, probably more so than we see her in the movies. And you got the Loki TV series, what they said is going to be Focusing on Loki, the one that we saw in Endgame who made it out with the Tesseract when they were playing with time and we don't know where he went. So that's the Loki that this series is going to be focusing on. And then there's going to be a Hawkeye series, which will take place after the events of Endgame, showing Hawkeye taking on Kate Bishop as his apprentice to become the next Hawkeye. 
So, and all the actors from the movies are going to be back for these TV shows, which is awesome. And Kevin Feige, the president of Marvel Studios, says these are important series and stories to the overall Marvel Cinematic Universe. So, big things are going to be happening in this series, which fans are going to want to check out. So, I'm excited for those. But then you got, of course, movies coming out, sequels, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, which is a great title. <laughs> and they even said the WandaVision series is going to connect to Doctor Strange because Scarlet Witch will be in that movie. Then you got another Thor movie coming out, Thor Love and Thunder. Out of all the three big uh, original Avengers, Thor is the only one who got a fourth movie. But um, Ragnarok was a big success, and everyone loved what Taika Waititi did with that movie. So it only made sense that they would bring him back to do a sequel. But it's going to be different because they're going to go the route of Jane Foster becoming Thor like she did in the comics. And much to my surprise, Natalie Portman is back as Jane <laughs> Foster and it's going to be the new Thor because I didn't think she would be back because as we, I think we talked about it when our Marvel discussions where yeah. um, her relationship with Marvel didn't end on the best of terms, <laughs> how she wasn't happy with what went down with Thor, the dark world and how Patty Jenkins uh, left the project. So didn't think she'd come back to the franchise, but apparently um, she liked uh, what, I guess the story they're going to tell in Thor Love and Thunder. So it's cool that she's going to be back and that they're going that route where Jane Foster will be come Thor like she did in the comics. So, yeah. And, and I thought that they were over or she, she, she was over franchises. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> she really hasn't done much since then. As far as, like you said, franchises go. But, yeah. Yeah. I mean, she had star Wars and I thought she was over that. And she must really like the story that's going to be told in the Thor movie, yeah. so I think that bodes or, well for it. Or maybe it's the title because I love that title. Yeah, for <laughs> the Love and Thunder. I know it's it's the best titled, yeah, best titled Marvel movie. I know a lot of people agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> Got a lot of traction on Twitter when it made that announcement. Yeah, I then, wonder if um, Stellan Skarsgård is going to be back. Uh, maybe i mean with jane back you know yeah. his character they were pretty close <laughs> together so he didn't die right no he didn't oh, okay so Slightly there's potential sure. for him to come back yeah but then the new franchises that they're going to kick off in this next phase you got the eternals which i'll be honest i'm not familiar with at all <laughs> with their comic history i know they were created by jack kirby um and they have those kirby designs but it is a cosmic story so it's going to be dealing with a lot of space and cosmic stuff. And I know it's going to deal with the Celestials, which were explored a little bit in Guardians of the Galaxy, both movies, um, of how they're co- like these cosmic gods <laughs> and who have a big influence on the universe. So the fact that they're exploring more of that aspect of the Marvel cosmic side of things has me excited, even though I'm not familiar with a lot of those characters. So, And again, that's not a bad thing because look what Marvel did with Guardians of the Galaxy, <laughs> another franchise that not a lot of people were familiar with and now they become you know household names and much <laughs> amongst like these popular uh, genre movies so it might be the same with eternals but Can the one i do it twice it, i wouldn't put it past marvel to do it twice yeah. <laughs> i mean they have they haven't had a failure yet so <laughs> you can't start it out and now yeah but the one i'm really excited for is shang chi and the legend of the ten rings this is another character I'm not familiar with at all, but the fact that they're going into that kung fu movie style, which should be something different from the MCU, should be really cool. But also the fact that they're delving into the Ten Rings and the Mandarin, the real Mandarin, finally, not the fake one from Iron Man 3, <laughs> which upset a lot of people. And I'm sure it kind of played into them bringing the Mandarin into the sh- movie. But oh, I think I it's forgot great. about that. that yeah. <laughs> That was just an actor, right? Yep. And <laughs> nah, a lot of people weren't happy. And I will say, which is kind of disappointing, there are some people who still aren't happy that they're using the Mandarin for this movie because they feel, oh, it's another Iron Man villain being used for someone else. And, you know, he wasn't used in Iron Man. And he is Iron Man's number one villain, pretty much his Joker. And the fact that to a lot of people, he was wasted in Iron Man 3 didn't sit well. But for me... I'm just glad they're not letting that character go to waste just because there's no more Iron Man movies. I mean, the fact that they're just using that history and legacy of Iron Man because he was such an integral part of the MCU, obviously, he kicked the whole thing off. And the fact that his presence and his legacy is still going to be felt in other movies, 
I think it's going to be great. So I love the fact that they're bringing the Mandarin in for Shang-Chi and that they're going to dive into the Ten Rings, which is an aspect that's been teased at but not fully explored in the MCU. So the fact that it's going to be in this movie is pretty exciting. So I'm excited for that one. And then I forgot to mention also for the Disney Plus series, they're going to make a What If animated series which is kind of like those else worlds or what if tales of what if this happened instead of this happening, how would things be different? And that sounds pretty cool as well. Cause I was, I'm always a fan of those type of comics and the fact that it's going to be an animated series kind of set in the MCU with the original actors in the movies, voicing their characters for this animated series should be pretty cool as well. So that's another thing to look forward to in this phase. But then they ended the panel with a big surprise where they announced that there's going to be a, a new blade series and it's going to be play or blade is going to be played by none other than Maharshala Ali as blade. And that surprised a lot of people. And I got to say, I'm not a huge blade fan because just vampire <laughs> stories and settings in general, I'm just never a fan of, I think it's a staple and genre that's overplayed sometimes. But when you get Maharshala Ali involved in anything, that's enough to, you know, <laughs> warrant you to, pay a little more interest to be a little more excited about it than originally because he's such a great actor and now he's going to be in the Marvel Cinematic Universe even though he was caught in the mouth on Luke Cage and technically I'm using air quotes here that was supposed to be in the Marvel Cinematic Universe but the movies never paid attention to those series anyway so they're probably just obviously they're ignoring that so not a huge surprise but that blew a lot of people away so a lot of cool stuff announced at their panel. I know everyone was waiting for, you know, the Fox stuff to be announced, like X-Men and Fantastic Four. But Kevin Feige did tease that, you know, there just wasn't enough time to talk about the Fantastic Four and Mutants. So, you know, those are in development. He just got to wait a little bit. So, yeah, a lot of stuff to be excited about. Not just with Marvel, obviously, but a lot of comic book stuff on the DC side of things as well, as we talked about. Batman Beyond, Blu-ray, the TV shows for like Watchmen and Titan Season 2 for me. So, just a lot of great stuff. I will say, though, Saturday up for Comic-Con did not quite feel the same without Warner Brothers there because they always deliver with trailers for the next big movies. And if they were here at this Comic-Con, I'm sure we would have gotten a trailer for Wonder Woman 1984 and the Birds of Prey film, which would have been fun to geek out about on that day. But we didn't. The presence was missed, I, I will say. But um, still a lot of cool stuff to be excited about, as always, with Comic-Con. So another Comic-Con uh, uh, came and went but the excitement never goes away so already looking forward to what next year is going to have in store for us but until then a lot of great content that we're going to get between this july and next july so a lot of stuff to be excited about yeah um did you see the uh lion king i did see the lion king yes was it any good i mean I, I, i've i've heard that uh be, be, before you get into uh what you're going to say I've heard that it's just a shot-for-shot shot remake of the animated Lion King. It kind of is, but yeah. I am totally okay with that. I really, really liked it, actually. I mean, I knew going into it, that's what it was going to be, and that's pretty much all I was looking for because it's a classic, great story, right. but it's being told in a totally different way like never before with that realistic animation. I mean... I keep wanting to say live action, but we know it's not live action. But that lifelike animation was just so impressive. And to see the story be told like that, it blew me away. I mean, just being a lover of animals and nature, just seeing it, that story be brought to life looking as real as it could be was just phenomenal. So I, I really liked it. Like I said, you're getting the same story. They added a few things here and there, a little more background stuff to Scar's history which was kind of neat to get, but I overall, I enjoyed it. I mean, it's a great story. It's just another way to experience the story in a way like never before. And to me, I just like having that option. Do I want to see the story in the classic animation style or do I want to see it in a lifelike style? Because to me, both work. I will say the certain vo vocal performance is definitely not as good as the original. To me, mainly Timon and Pumbaa, which going into it, I've heard were the standouts of it, but yeah. To me, those original voice actors were just so definitive for those characters and just stuck with me, obviously, for these over 20 years that out of all the new voices for these characters in the new movies, they're the ones that stood out to me the most of not feeling quite right, where the other ones 
actually worked really well, especially she would tell Edgy for a scar. I mean, Jeremy Irons is great and it was a mm-hmm. fantastic performance. And she would tell Edgy of is different, but he really captured that sinister um, style that scar had. It was different, but I thought it worked really well for this movie. So yeah, there's a lot that I loved about it. A few nitpicks here and there that a few changes or not changes, but a few things that didn't quite work as well in live action that the animated version had. And a few added things that felt unnecessary, like how Rufiki found out Simba is alive, was a little heavy handed <laughs> in this one and wasn't necessarily needed. But then there's stuff that I felt it improved on in the than the animated one did, like the end sequence where you just see this all out battle between lions and hyenas go at it. And again, seeing it in that lifelike animation was so impressive. So, yeah, I really, really liked it. How was uh, John Oliver as Rafiki? Uh- no, John Oliver was Zazu, the bird. Zazu, yeah. sorry. He, he was good. <laughs> and oh. a little bit of screen time he had. He actually had an added sequence as well, which was kind of fun. Oh, really? Mm. Well, what was the added sequence? It was where um, Nala was trying to um, sneak out of Pride Rock from Scar and the Hyenas, and Zazu kind of helped her with that by causing the distraction between Scar and the Lions, which, we oh, didn't get, which wasn't in the animated version, but it was a little fun little sequence. So, yeah, I give it two um, thumbs up. Oh, good. Because um, I was just wondering about it because I know it's not getting good reviews. And no, it's, it's a actually... A lot of people... I've gotten a lot of mixed reviews, which I wasn't expecting. Because especially yeah. after the first reactions from the premiere, it sounded like, oh, it's going to be, you know, a critical success. It's already a box office success. It's doing great. Right. <laughs> but what's the prize at the mixed reviews? Mm. And I, um, I am just assuming... That um, Beyonce is good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she she was great as Nala. Yeah, uh, good. And the good. Go you know the rendition of "Can You Feel the Love Tonight" between her and uh, yeah Dan, uh, Donald Glover. Yeah, it sounded good. But the one nitpick I've seen a lot of people have, and I share it too, is that the song was being sung during the daytime and it's called can you feel the love tonight <laughs> so, <laughs> just didn't quite fit with the visuals when you're hearing those lyrics being so <laughs> yeah i see well that's good to hear i mean uh, yeah that was, i was just wondering about that because i figured you've seen it mm-hmm. um so yeah if you want to hear my full review me and kyle did a thunder quack reviewed episode of it which you can check out oh on you did YouTube. yeah so <laughs> I gotta, I gotta we actually talked that. about something other than Star Wars on a podcast, which I don't think <laughs> ever happened before. <laughs> I'm sure Star Wars made its way. Oh, of course. Into, <laughs> of course. But. Like, uh, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, um, is that it for a feature topic? Or do yeah. you want to talk about something else? No, that's all the Comic-Con highlights for me that I wanted to talk about. So, Okay, because I, I know you wanted to talk about a movie and a TV show, Tim. Which um, we didn't get to, which we wanted to talk about on our previous episode, if we were able to record two weeks right. ago. But uh, so, yeah. kind of older bit of news, but Spider Man or Far From Home came out a few weeks ago, and I don't know if you have you had a chance to see it yet, Dane. Yes, I have. Okay, cool. And I loved it. I didn't nice. expect to <laughs> to like it um, because I, I I didn't really get. Well, oh, for, for one, who um, Mysterio was, mm-hmm. um, and two, I didn't know if that whole we're gonna go to Europe and we're gonna go to like Prague, you know, thing was gonna work. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they they do a really good job. Yeah, I loved it too. I thought it was great. I mean, I was excited just the fact that Mysterio was gonna be the Spider Man villain for this movie. Because him and Venom were the two villains I've been wanting to see the most in a Spider-Man movie. And... Oh, Tim, uh, be- before you get to it, uh, I was just wondering, like, is that Mysterio's story? That um, he was, uh, yeah. Um, not really. They. Oh. I'll get into, <laughs> I guess, his original background and what they did yeah. for this movie. But, yeah, I'm just so excited that Mysterio was going to be in it. And they did not disappoint. The way they utilize his powers, that whole uh, spoiler alert if you haven't seen the movie yet. It's been out several weeks, but I'll still throw it out there. But that illusion sequence he had for Spider-Man, oh, that, was, that was amazing to see. Exactly what I was hoping to see, knowing that Mysterio was going to be in this movie. It was just so well done. 
And like I said, they did change his origin a little bit because in the comics, he's just an, a special effects artist for movies. And so he uses illusions and trickery to mislead people and to make them think they're seeing things that aren't there. And they did have a little bit of that in here, which I was glad that, you know, kind of paid a little homage to his original origins. But the way that they had him be a former Stark employee and but still kind of developing that type of illusion technique and they tied it into Civil War for that barf technology that Tony Stark utilized in the beginning of that film to where he's talking with his parents. The fact that Quentin Beck was the developer of that, I thought was really cool and a great way to have him be part of the MCU's history, but them having him become a full-fledged villain in this movie because of that. It, just, it was the best of both worlds. They had a new element to it, but still keeping with his classic origin story of him being someone who develops that type of technology that deals with illusions and kind of special effects type thing. And even you see him developing a new sequence where he's in the mocap suit and he's with the other Stark employees like that harken back to his special effects background, but yet kind of being brought into the modern age because that's what special effects are now <laughs> where you develop that type of stuff. So I love what they did in Mysterio and this, and like you said, the vacation aspect of it worked really well. It's just a really entertaining movie. The cast is great. You know, Tom Holland's great as Peter Parker and Spider-Man his dynamic with his friends, especially with Ned, is just very entertaining. So just a lot of great stuff about it. Uh, I was very, very happy. And then you get the great moment in the uh, post credit scene or mid credit scene. Oh, I oh say. yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. The highlight. The highlight of yeah. the movie. J.K. Say. Simmons back as J. Jonah Jameson. <laughs> oh, man. How great was that? <laughs> Working for um, the dailybugle.net. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Is it dot net? Or I think it... so. Yeah, it's not but, like, yeah, it's not a paper. It's still, they're really going the Spider-Man PS4 game route with it. It seems yeah, like, it, yeah, which works really well with that. So it makes sense to use that in the movie as well. So yeah, that was great. Even though uh, I got spoiled on that beforehand by oh, you did. Yeah, someone on Twitter just out of nowhere responded to a comment by my friend Paul, who wasn't even talking about Spider-Man. He just a he. he Nothing to do with Spider-Man. It could have been about music or sports or something. And then just some random person who follows him responded to a tweet saying, did you hear a rumor about J.K. Simmons being back as J. Jonah Jameson? Oh. And it was like right after the premiere. So when I saw that, I was like, oh, so that's probably likely because word's getting out for people who've seen it. So I was like, ah, oh, got to be kidding me. It was still awesome to see, but I can't imagine going in, not fully expecting it, how cool that would have been. But wasn't meant to be, sadly. Yeah. But. It was great. Highlight, highlight highlight of the movie for me, besides all the Spider Man stuff. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I just love that Marvel and Sony decided. You know what? There's no one better for the role as Jameson, even though it's a different continuity. You still got to have him back as Jameson. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, how, how can you top what? Um, uh, what's his name? Uh, J.K. Simmons did. You can't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you just, just best to bring it back. Yeah, and he, he he's obviously not going to be Commissioner Gordon anytime no. soon. So <laughs> might as well bring him back into the Marvel uh, Spider Man or the Spider Man universe. Yeah, don't let a great performance go to waste when he's still available and willing to do it as well. <laughs> so yeah, and I guess the other big thing that came out during our brief little hiatus there was Stranger Things season three, which you and me are big fans of the series and the new season kicked off, but I'm um, texting you about it. It seems like you're going to have a different opinion on it <laughs> than yeah. maybe most. And for me, I probably agree with you on some things, but I think I enjoyed it more than you did. But I will say it wasn't my favorite out of the three. Still a lot of stuff to enjoy, but to me didn't quite reach the level of greatness that the first two had, in my opinion. Oh, did you want me to go? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I was wondering. I, I guess also a spoiler going. warning here, yeah. too, because I'm sure we'll mention stuff that happens at the end. Okay. So I texted you that, um, you know, I had watched at that point when I texted you, like, the first two episodes. Mm, okay. Uh, yeah, like, the with the, the underground uh, thing with the Russians and that big mm. key thing. Yeah. And, um uh Dustin and uh I forget his name. What's his Steve. name? Uh, Steve are are um 
are at the mall and Robin is there. You know, I, I just didn't understand what was going on. Um, and so just for this show, I, I figured I had just, I just power through it. Um, just try my best to power through it. Um, it, it, it was a great cameo. Um, by uh, Sean Astin as Bob again. <laughs> oh, it's like, it's like Bob. Um, it's so sad to see his Radio Shack closed down. Yeah, um, <laughs> he was the only one keeping it alive, barely. Yeah. Uh, but I have to say, it is a tale of two seasons mm. because I did not like the first half of it. Uh, just with the mall stuff, it 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 was so loosely done that I, I don't. I I think it worked against what they were trying to do because you, you know you have Dustin and Steve picking up a a, a Russian signal um, with Robin, and then you have uh, you know the the main kids off doing their thing. Then you got the the whole eleven and. Um, uh, Mike story and the, so you the, the Harper, Harper and, and yeah, um, oh, I forget her name. Yeah, Winona Ryder's character. Yeah, I'm Winona her name too, right? <laughs> <laughs> Joyce, that's her name. Uh, Joyce, right? You have that story going on. Um, just didn't know it, it. It was so loosely connected that yeah. it didn't work for me. Um, but the second half the four through eight when they do the when they, when they lock um billy into the the sauna yeah mm-hmm. and stuff that's wow. when it started kick it started to kick off for me felt the exact same way yeah <laughs> that was a it, great uh, episode and scene right right and then you, you have that whole flashback scene in the next episode with 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 billy and then you of course have the conclusion and i guess we're supposed to assume that hopper is gone that's that's uh, what they want you to assume <laughs> yeah. I, I just thought that this uh it the, the the way that all these stories came together uh was really well done um and I, i'm gonna go out on a scene uh I, 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 I will say that this is my favorite season of stranger things wait what <laughs> <laughs> wow <laughs> Just from would, a dialogue standpoint, I mean, you have that whole thing with, with, with Billy and uh, his flashback, and then that that monologue when, um, you know, in uh, in the last episode where where Eleven is saying like, "Oh, she she was really beautiful, your mom," you know, yeah. that whole thing, and then you have that Robin scene. I, I didn't think she was going to be a big character in the in this show. Yeah, I mean. Then, yeah. And you have that monologue in the in the bathroom mm-hmm. where she comes out. Uh, it 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 just totally took me by surprise. Um, I I didn't think this was going to be really good, judging from the first couple of episodes. Uh, that whole thing with um, I forget her name, uh, Mike's mom and Billy. Oh yeah, <laughs> I was like, oh, hey, we don't have to do this yeah, here. That, that um, didn't. <laughs> development yeah. anywhere really yeah. that, that was more of a let's get this character here and then he can get uh possessed by the yeah. demon <laughs> um didn't need that but it really picked up from the fourth episode and i just totally totally enjoyed this season not the first couple episodes but from, from the fourth episode to the end it just totally took me by surprise i i, I I didn't expect like the emotional depth of it, uh, judging from the first couple of episodes. You know, you uh-huh. have the stuff with, with Billy's mom, you have the Robin stuff, you have the Hopper stuff being let down at at, at the supposed date night. And as soon as um, Joyce said like, "Oh yeah, I'll, I'll meet you at this time," I knew ho- something was going to happen to Hopper. Uh-huh. <laughs> I was like, "Yeah, Hopper's yeah. going to make it up." Um, so like, if if this season is an indication, it's don't date. Joyce, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> it it really well. Oh, you seem to be right there, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Bob got it pretty bad. Hopper yeah. is gone. <laughs> um, did not expect the emotional depth, especially like the end when um, when 
Eleven is reading the note. Oh man, yeah. Yeah, that How can I get a lump in your throat when <laughs> yeah. it was playing out? <laughs> um, yeah, so definitely uh, probably my favorite season of of um, Stranger Things so far. They they got all that filler stuff out of the way in the beginning. Uh, one of my biggest criticisms of season two was when uh, Eleven goes on her road trip yeah. and becomes becomes goth. See, I'm one of the few who actually like that episode. I, yeah, I just like how it explored more of yeah. other people being experimented on and what Eleven had to go through. So I actually uh, like that. I did like that stuff with her mom. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, her becoming like a goth and you know stuff like that. I didn't really. Didn't really, uh, didn't really like. They they got all that filler stuff out of the way in the beginning, which is what I hope their intention was. Um, and a lot of the stuff, um, especially like the the calling back stuff, like the retro stuff, like oh, you remember arcades? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was mostly handled in the beginning of the episode with with the mall. I, I, I'm assuming the big thing was the mall. Like yeah. oh. You remember out of the mall you know uh that stuff was taken i mean that that stuff was taken care of in the beginning of the 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 episodes right the beginning of the season and the mall did make for a pretty cool setting for the final confrontation with the monster (laughs) and you got the fireworks going off it did look cool even like the school the 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 whole scene in the school in episode four Mm -hmm. four or five i thought worked really well yeah lock billy into the sauna yeah. Wow. Well, this is totally unexpected. See, this is what happens. I don't follow up with the text to see if you finished it, <laughs> waiting for the episode. Because I was, like I said, I was expecting for me to like it more than you did. But with you saying it's your favorite season, you obviously liked it more than I did. Now. <laughs> yeah. It's that's uh, the upside down of opinions here. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of the upside down, I, my big thing for the season was I hope they they or i wish that they would would have gotten over that upside down thing mm, well so, that, like, that seems just to be the it. yeah the narrative of the whole series but i do know what you're saying because it did kind of feel a little uh repetitive of the goal for the second season is Siri just turned on yeah <laughs> i had my phone on my bed and i had my legs kicked up on the bed and i guess i must have stomped on it or moved it or something because Siri turned on <laughs> and said hi. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> sorry for the Siri interruption there. Yeah. But uh, like like you said, the the goal, I guess, is trying to prevent the monster from getting out. A little familiar, but at the same time, they did enough different stuff within the season to not feel it totally like a retread. So, so I, guess, I will say, I guess they got to do something a little different for the next season to have that three years in a row <laughs> where it's kind of, they're trying to yeah. do the same thing. But, yeah, and um, another highlight for me is Carrie Elwes as the the politician. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's just a nothing role. It doesn't mean anything. He gets beat <laughs> up a lot. He <laughs> does get beat up a lot. I just love the way he plays it as like this. Typical this sleazeball. Yeah, sleazeball. <laughs> politician. Kind of yeah. Small town mayor guy. Uh-huh. <laughs> I really like that. Um also, I, I I do have to say, well, my favorite storyline was the um, the Dustin, Steve, and Robin storyline. I really liked how it was kind of comedic and stuff. Uh, but I do have to say that I liked um, the the Nancy and I forget Jonathan the brother Jonathan. I I, I did like how. You, you know, she she's just like a intern at a small town newspaper, and they treat her like garbage. And you know, she she decides to go on her her own and investigate like these exploding rat things. Yeah, <laughs> I, I really like that storyline too. Yeah, well, overall, I, I really enjoyed it. Like I said, I think it was bad, but there were certain things about it that kept it from being as great as the first two, in my opinion. But I mean, one thing you know about Stranger Things you're going to get great performances from pretty much all of these actors. And this season didn't disappoint as well. There was just so much great stuff. I mean, Millie Bobby Brown knocks it out of the park as 11 in every scene she's in, whether it's an action sequence where she's great, but then you got the emotional stuff like at the last episode where she's reading that letter and you got 
Harper, David Harper's uh, voiceover going against with showing her reaction and her emotions and just great stuff. And I did like like the overall narrative thread I thought was really good and where it left things and set up for season four has me really excited. The fact that, you know, the kids are split up now. You got 11 moving in with uh, Joyce and uh, Will and Jonathan going to another city and they're not going to be together. She lost her powers. So it's going to be interesting to see how that plays into next season, how she's, I assume she'll get them back, but how long it takes and whether it has some consequences. So all that stuff has me excited for next season. And, but like, like I said, a lot of great stuff. The action was on point. That big monster, the CG was really good. I mean, it's almost movie quality stuff. So great moments with these characters. The thing that kind of held it back for me the most, and I agree with you said about the first few episodes, you know, taking a little while to get going. To me, it was the humor and the tone early on. It just felt like they were leaning more towards the comedy route than the drama route and the character driven stuff more so. And to me, it stood out. And not all of it was bad. Some of it was good, but some of it sent a little over the top too, or just a little too much. Whether it's the reactions from certain people, like a lot of the Hopper and Joy stuff, where they're just arguing all the time as a like a married couple. I know they're trying to set up the feelings they have for each other that they don't want to admit that they have, but cert- got a little too much to me. Where it just felt like that that was the main focus to get those jokes and humor in there, not just with them, but some of the other characters as well like with steve and dustin early on and robin and those mall sequences and then with lucas's sister um i know they wanted to give her a bigger role but she just comes off as annoying little brat <laughs> most yeah. of the time she is like that type of like humor that, that didn't work for me i mean i mean i'm fine with giving her more to do but to scale back a little bit on you know her like smart aleck remarks that you know <laughs> someone who just needs to be disciplined <laughs> yeah. by someone older so that stuff didn't work for me and then the biggest com- comedical moment that or did i say comedical that's not a word <laughs> comedic comical. moment comical yeah <laughs> in the, the last episode this one i both really liked and kind of cringed at the same time where dustin has his never-ending story duet <laughs> with oh. his girlfriend <laughs> see part of me loves it because it's the never-ending story song and it's awesome and the fact that they're yeah. paying homage to that is great but the way it was shot where it had that split screen shot of Dustin and her singing, it made it felt like they were making a parody of a music video that <laughs> took 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 me out of the moment where how the rest of the story is playing out in that episode. It's the season finale, so it's a big one. And I don't mind doing what they did. It made for a funny, lighthearted yeah. moment. But the way it was shot and the way they filmed it was it felt like I said, it felt like a music video and not a TV show. Right. So that one was kind of, I have a both love hate relationship with that moment <laughs> there. You, but... see, you see, I thought it worked. I thought it worked really well because um, I don't know if you, it, it, there's this one scene when they're singing the song uh, where, where um, uh, Steve and Robin are in the car. Yeah. I think it is. Yeah. 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 yeah they're, yeah, they're in the car. Too, uh, yeah, they're in the car and they're they're trying to drive, or is it, it, it is it Nancy and um, John? I think, I think they're all of them together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and like uh, you, you see the the giant mind flare chasing after them. Yeah, <laughs> they're just listening to the song. That worked for me. <laughs> um, yeah, I love seeing everyone's reactions. Mainly, is how it was shot with Dustin and his girlfriend there. <laughs> The way she's yeah. like looking at the camera or not looking at the camera, the way it's like, it just felt like a music video. <laughs> right. Um, the, the, the one comedic scene that didn't really work for me and it kind of went on too long for me was um, uh, Robin and Steve High. You know, oh. and then they, 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 they go into the, the movie oh, theater. Oh, that's right. Uh, uh, yeah. Back to the Future is playing and then mm. they, they're gone and they're in the bathroom and or, or yeah. they're looking up at the, the the plate glass window or something like yeah yeah <laughs> like that, that didn't that kind of went on too long but it it did lead to the scene in the bathroom where they're monologuing. Mm. So, I, I would agree with that. It did last a little too long, even though I love all the Back to the Future references. But <laughs> oh yeah, that was great. <laughs> so yeah, in the end, not my favorite season. Still a great watch though, and excited for where things are going to go in season four. So. Just more great stuff mixed in with 
a few more things that didn't work for me than season one and two did. Yeah. You know what I almost hope they do? Uh, what they're doing with the It 2 movie. Mm, uh, well, they show them as adults? Yeah. Like, they, they flash forward, like, you know, they're in their 20s or something, mm. you know? Maybe the last episode they'll have something like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, watching uh, season three of uh, Stranger Things, you know what I totally forgot about? What's that? That there was a Hellboy movie. Oh, it's out on Blu-ray already. I saw that Target. Wow. Way. <laughs> wow. That was fast. Yeah, they did. Do I guess, that yeah, I guess people didn't see it and the critics didn't like it. So. No, they didn't. Well, there, there's a movie for everybody, Tim. Yeah. <laughs> At least uh, David Harbour doesn't have to worry about putting all that makeup on again because I don't think yeah. there's going to be a sequel. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, that that's the... That is the end of our feature topic. Right? I guess in our catch-up session. <laughs> yeah, a catch-up session. That we didn't get to talk about what we didn't record. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but now we can move on to our comic book reviews. Um, uh, this episode we're going to do Detective Comics number 1008, uh, Batman number 75, and Batman TMNT 3 number 3, Tim. Yeah. <laughs> See, the, yes. hey, the three themes continuing. Yeah. And and like we say at the beginning of every single episode, Tim. I mean, every single comic book review. There's gonna be a lot of spoilers in this. So if you haven't read your books yet, pause it right here and um, read your books and come back to this later. So, um, what is going to be our rating scale for this episode, Tim? Let's tie it back all the way to the beginning. How about three eleven puns that Tim's tries to work in our Dark Knight Rises minute by minute commentary? <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> all right. So I'll start with Detective Comics 1008. This is kicking off a new arc, um, thankfully, because I was not a fan of that two-issue Spectre arc that (laughs) preceded this one. And we're getting the Joker here. And this looks to be just a one-off story, which I'm okay with. Sometimes it's nice to get that in some comics. And this story seems to be tying into the Year of the Villain theme that DC has going on and has to revolve around Lex Luthor. And apparently some big stuff has been going on in the Justice League comic, which... I just started reading Scott Snyder's run now that it's available on the DC Universe app. So going to be catching up as those get released on there. But apparently something happened where everyone thought Lex was dead, but he's actually still alive. And now he's trying to get in contact with several villains. And over the course of these two Batman issues I'll be reviewing, that's the case with uh, Mr. Freeze, Joker, and Bane. So with this issue, it deals with Joker throwing this big event at a carnival. Um, kind of similar to the settings we saw in Stranger Things Season 3 <laughs> with the carnival there. <laughs> but on the Batman front, it reminded me of the episode Be a Clown a little bit from Batman the Animated Series. That was set in an abandoned carnival, but um, we see Joker on a roller coaster here. This brought me back to that episode. And I believe this is the same one that takes place on The Killing Joke because Joker kind of makes a reference to that with Batman as like coming being back here, but under different circumstances. So Joker pretty much has the whole place hostage. He's has the workers and this attendants at this carnival with these Joker buttons that if you do anything wrong, they release the Joker toxin on you, which Joker does to a hot dog stand worker who kind of st- uh, stood up to the Joker, but paid the price when Joker activated the button and the laughing gas pretty much did him in. You know, Joker is this, in his own way, having fun with the citizens there until Batman shows up and throws a batarang at his arm. And then uh, if you think there's going to be an all-out fight between Batman and Joker right away, but they actually have some fun together because, um, you know, Joker is going to have an ace up his sleeve and Batman has to figure out what it is. So him and Batman have a little fun <laughs> going on some rides, um, enjoying some food going into a tunnel of love, sharing a tender moment. <laughs> so there's some fun stuff that's going on with Batman and Joker that you don't necessarily see. But that's all a purpose for Batman. He's just waiting to see what Joker's end game is here and to stop whatever he's doing. There's a great moment, though, where Batman, this kid comes up to Batman as him and Joker are strolling through the fairgrounds. He's just asking Batman, or, like, my mom and dad are real scared. Is think going to be okay? And uh, Batman just goes, it's okay to be scared, but I promise you, you'll be fine. And then Joker butts in and goes, ooh, you're overconfident, Batman. He's, and then Joker tries to ease the kid's pain by giving him a cookie. And the kid actually stands up to Joker, calling him a bully. But as Joker has him this cookie, uh, like before the kid could even grab it, Batman's hand just comes in and just 
crushes it real quick. And he just goes, he's full. Because <laughs> he knows there's probably something in that cookie that wouldn't be good for the kid to have. So once Batman and Joker make their way to the fortune teller booth um, where you stick your ticket or coin in, you get a fortune. But this ends up being Joker's you know, plan all along. Batman knows this is, this is a device he needs to take out his you know activation for the Joker toxin and then deactivate the buttons for all the people there. So which Batman does, Joker tries to escape <laughs> with a bunch of balloons as he flies away. But Batman has a great way to take him out as he stuck a little tracker on Joker's back. And that ends up being a signal for Batman to call a bunch of bats to pop Joker's balloons and just make him fall in the water. A typical Joker fashion that you see all the time. He goes into the water, can't find a body, but you know he's still alive. So that's basically it for that Joker aspect of the story. But then, like I said, we get into that Lex Luthor um, you're the villain aspect where he's tracking down Mr. Freeze and he's in this hood and he's like this in the Batman issue I'll talk about too where his face almost looks like the Joker. It's very pale, but you can, can't really see it. But you know it's Lex, Lex Luthor because that's who he refers, himself, he refers to himself as as well as Mr. Freeze. And he offers Mr. Freeze, you know, he has a way to cure his wife. And of course, you know, he wants to make a deal with him. And it looks like Mr. Freeze is going to be obliged to that <laughs> because, you know, he'll do whatever it takes uh, to save his wife. So the next issue of Detective Comics is going to have to deal with Mr. Freeze, which I'm sure we'll find out more what's entailed as far as Lex trying to bring back his wife. So this issue was just a fun one off to seeing the Batman Joker story, like I said, in a carnival setting that reminded me of some the Batman, the animated series episode, Be a Clown. So I'm going to give this one a solid three and a half. 311 references Tim tried to make in our Dark Knight Rises minute by minute commentary. And that brings us to Batman number 75. And before I get into this one, since we didn't uh, record our ske- our normally scheduled episode, um, I want to recap Batman 74 just real quick because that ended the arc with Thomas Wayne and Bruce Wayne and how I said when I reviewed issue 73, I was excited about the possibility of bringing back Martha Wayne. You got Thomas and Martha back and what that means for Batman. And sadly, that issue didn't go in that direction. Um, Bruce stopped Thomas Wayne from using that uh, other Lazarus pit um, to bring her back from the dead. And it was a great fight between Bruce and Thomas Wayne, which is entertaining to see. And I liked how that issue harkened back to that story. Thomas would tell Bruce about those animals who fell in a hole and they kind of Ate up, ate up each other and how that was Bruce's favorite story and Thomas didn't know why and Bruce in that issue revealed why that was so great stuff there but I uh, was a little disappointed with the outcome where they didn't fully go for it that's what I was hoping for as I said and that issue ended kind of you know it in the way that wasn't clear to let you know what happens where you don't see the total end of that fight between Thomas and Bruce but you see Bruce come out of it or just like the hand if I remember right coming out of that cave and so, you know, Bruce defeated Thomas, but at the same time, that's where the issue ends. And then Batman 75 picks up where, you know, things are in total disarray in Gotham. <laughs> it's called, this kicks off the City of Bane arc, where it's just full-blown craziness where the villains rule Gotham City. Now, I didn't have a chance to flip through this one uh, before we started recording, and it's been a, while, a few weeks since I read it. But um, this one was kind of a mixed bag for me as I read it the first time, because I do like the idea that Tom King is just going full-blown, Gotham City is run by the villains. We've seen that type of story before, but not quite on this scale. I mean, you got Hugo Strange as the commissioner, and you see him go up to light the bat signal, and Thomas Wayne is already back in Gotham as the Batman of this, you know, Gotham run by the villains. And instead of a Robin, he has Gotham Girl as his sidekick, so she's she's back in full force with her powers taking down criminals and is kind of the perfect sidekick for Thomas Wayne to have because they are kind of <laughs> no nonsense brutality of justice that they have and they work well together. But then you got some crazy aspects of it where the Joker and Riddler are kind of two beat cops as partners <laughs> as detective, which was kind of funny to see I, more so with the Riddler than anything. He has this great bit of dialogue where people are complaining about paperwork and he does police paperwork and Riddler just goes, I love paperwork. And that's just so Riddler. <laughs> of course, he'd say something like that. But they have Gotham PD under lockdown where or under their control. We see Bullock tied up like in his underwear just in the office of the Gotham City Police Department, unable to escape. So the villains are ruling everything. But 
I just have a hard time believing the Joker would go along with this, where he's just regulated to being a police officer or a, a facade detective working with the Riddler as his partner. I'm sure that's trying to tie it into Tom King's story of how they were at odds with the war of jokes and riddles event that happened a while back. So to see them working together now is probably what he was going for as something that you didn't expect to see. But in, not just with this story, but in other stories in general, where there's another Batman villain who's trying to get other Batman villains to work for him or work under him. I just have a hard time with taking that the Joker would do that. He'd have to have something else up his sleeve because he doesn't work for anybody. He has his own schemes and agendas. And for him to go along with something, to me, it would have to be because he has his own reasons for doing so, not just because Bane's in control and he has no choice. I don't picture the Joker doing that. So and that's the impression I had here in this issue where they didn't allude to anything where Joker has his own agenda, but it just seems he's here because, you know, Bane's in control and that's what he has to do. And that, don't, that doesn't always sit well with me. So maybe Tom King will do something that reveals that the Joker is only going along with it because he has his own agenda or plan that, and he's using Bane's plan to fulfill what he needs to do. So we'll see. But I just, whenever I see Joker like that, it just doesn't feel right. So, um, and also this issue, I remember it goes back to Bruce making his way to, you know, he's traveling the world, going back to where he trained in the snowy mountains, looking for his sensei, but he's not there. And he gets ambushed by this, these like two punk kid robbers who beat him up and try to steal from him. And they beat him up pretty bad. And uh, they kind of even slashed. I remember they stabbed him a few times as well. And he's just kind of left for dead in the mountain hilltops. But then um, we get the dialogue of scene talking about the boat in the streets. And, you know, who the only person he has that argument with, which is Catwoman. (laughs) And we see Catwoman rescue Bruce here. And they are reunited for the first time since she left him on the rooftop not showing up for the wedding. So Tom King really is setting up for this to be, you know, his, the final arc of his run here, where it's going to be Batman and Catwoman going up against Bane and taking back the city. And that brings me to the other aspect of Lex Luthor at the end of this issue, trying to recruit Bane, but Bane declines. And I like this bit of dialogue here because Bane is just content with controlling Gotham. He doesn't care about the world or the multiverse or anything like that. And Luthor is kind of surprised But I just remember reading Bane's reasoning was so well done because this is out of all the times Batman helped save the universe, the multiverse, the world. The only thing he hasn't done was take full control of Gotham. No matter what all the good he does, there's always villains. There's always crimes in Gotham. And he's never able to have that control where there's just peace uh, around the streets with no crime to worry about. Batman has never had that victory, but now Bane does as far as having control of Gotham, having to be run by the villains. And to him, that's all he needs. That's all the only victory that matters to him. And I like that aspect of that's all Bane cares about. So I liked how that issue ended here. So this one was kind of a mixed bag for me. I liked certain aspects of it. Some stuff didn't you know, necessarily sit right. Some of it felt way over the top. It almost kind of reminded me of a Gotham episode, as crazy as that sounds, because we know the crazy directions Gotham goes sometimes. And I kind of felt that with this one, with the villains in control of everything. So I'm going to give this one a uh, three out of five, 311 references and puns Chin tried to make in the Dark Knight Rises, Dark Knight Rises minute by minute commentary for this episode. And then finally, you know, this issue came out a few weeks ago, but I can't let a comic book review sec- section go by without talking about a Batman TMNT comic. So, <laughs> and for number three, This one gave me something I never knew I wanted to see, but so glad I got it. This issue combined the origins of Batman and the Ninja Turtles into one story, and it was so well done. I mean, that's how the issue kicked off. I loved it so much. It was the highlight of the issue for me, just the way James um, Tynan combined the classic Turtle story with the classic Batman origin story and making it work so well. It was just bravo to him because it kicks off with... Not Joe Chill mugging the Waynes, but he robs the truck that contained the mutagen that mutated the turtles. Because in that comic, there was a, you know, again, it's very similar to Daredevil. The creators of the turtles reference how it was their homage to Daredevil, where there was an accident with the truck and the mutagen fell out. And that's what caused Splinter and the turtles to mutate. Well, in here, we see Batman and, or I should say, Bruce and Thomas and Martha walking out of the screening of Zorro. But before they leave, there's this, uh, a stand that's selling pet turtles. So Thomas decides to buy it for Bruce. 
and there's four turtles in there. And I like they even go with the names. Um, they go, Martha goes, what are you going to name him? And he, Bruce says, you know, we've been learning about art in school. So I'll name him Raphael, Donatello, Michelangelo, and Leonardo. <laughs> Got to have that classic uh, tie into the Renaissance artists for their names. So they even had that with Bruce here. So well, good, good he wasn't into, or there, there wasn't Marvel movies back then. Because yeah. it would have been like Thor, <laughs> Hawkeye. Yeah. <laughs> Captain America. Man, I, I, Captain yeah. America. <laughs> Wouldn't quite have the same effect. President Robert Redford. <laughs> Imagine that for a Ninja Turtle name. <laughs> so, but they still take that shortcut into Crime Alley, but instead of Joe Chill just walking up to them with a gun, the truck he stole with the mutinim, mutagen is just driving straight towards them. So Thomas has to push Bruce out of the way, and that causes him to drop his the, the bowl with the turtles. And instead of Thomas and Martha getting shot, they just get run over by the truck. Still driven by Joe Chill, though. And I like the reaction that Bruce had here. He sees a mutagen fall out. It hits the turtles or where the turtles fell into the sewer. And Bruce just goes like, Mom, Dad, I dropped my turtles. And he looks over and he just sees their bodies mutilated by being run over. And he just screams no. And he just can't believe what he's seeing. And he sees the mutagen fall into the sewer and he goes into the sewer trying to at least save the turtles that he lost. But I liked how this mirror of him, instead of falling into the cave or into the well that led to the back cave, this is him falling into a sewer to where the turtles and Splinter are going to be mutated. And the way that it was, the artwork was laid out and drawn, making you remember that instance of Bruce falling into the well as a kid is just, you know, the way it just switched it up here to combine with the turtles' origin was just so well done. I loved it so much. And thus, driving home the story aspect here that Bruce thinks him and the Turtles are brothers. And it makes sense because, you know, he bought them. They were going to be his pets. And with the mutagen, they were able to grow up together as brothers. So I just loved how James Tynan worked in both origin stories into one combination here. It was just so well done. I just geeked out so much reading that. So that was the highlight of the issue for me. But the rest of the story continues where Bruce is trying to or is starting to realize that that's not his true memories. He's starting to remember other things and he has to try to figure that out for himself. So he leaves to go to Wayne Manor and the turtles are trying to wake up their own real memories as well. And they realize that the original Raphael tells them that April is the one they need to find in order to do that because, you know, she's the key to their history as well. So Bruce goes to Wayne Manor. He sees Alfred. That really triggers his full memories coming back. There's this great moment where Alfred recognizes him and he just immediately runs to Bruce and hugs him. And once he does, Bruce immediately remembers his true origin. You see Joe Chill murder Thomas and Martha Wayne. You see the determination in Bruce's eyes as he lays over his parents' dead bodies. You see the bat crash into the window and you know Bruce has his memory back. It's an awesome moment. So as the Turtles try to look for April, they're ambushed by the Joker Shredder, (laughs) the leader of the Smile Gang, and they're able to actually uh, take out the original Raphael, and Krang is able to lock onto him and transport him back um, to his ship uh, to where you know, he was originally taken or escaped from. So um, the original Raph is gone, which was nice, sad to say, or sad to see happen because I loved his presence there. But the four turtles here, they're kind of realizing that, yeah, things are what they should be. Um, they're starting to remember that they got to get their own history back as well. And Raphael realizes there's one way to do that. The original Raph told him, you know, you need to get the foot original Foot Clan back. You need to stop this smile gain. If you do that, you'll be able to get your memories and your history back. And that means they have to find Oroku Saki, the original Shredder. So that's where the issue ends with the Turtles, not in their Robin costumes anymore, which was a cool thing to see in the first two issues, but they're just back to their normal colored bandanas. And Leonardo says to Shredder, or I should say Arokusaki, telling them that what's going on and says they need his help. So next we're going to get Arokusaki and the Turtles teaming up, which I cannot wait for. So again, another fun, great issue of Batman TMNT that just speaks to my Batman and TMNT fandom heart that I love so much. So uh, this issue is going to get another four out of five. 311 references Tim tried to make in his Dark Knight Rises minute by minute commentary for this episode. Another great one. I loved it. It's a lot of references. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think I almost hit that mark. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, that's it for our episode. A um, lot to talk about this past episode. Yeah. Tim. A lot of um, fun stuff, though. Yeah. Uh, but just go over to the Batman Universe.net, Facebook.com slash Batman Universe. 
Twitter handle is at Batman Universe. The show's Twitter handle is at Batman's Podcast. Tim's Twitter handle is at TimG311. Thank and you my Twitter for the handle, special occasion. <laughs> yeah, for the special occasion, Tim. And my Twitter handle is at Dane Says Banana. Uh, rate and review us on iTunes, and you can email the show at bestfansofalpass at gmail.com. So with that, like we say at the end of every single episode, Tim. We love each and every one of you with all of our Voyager hearts. <laughs> See you guys next time. See you later, everybody. Yeah.